Hey guys, welcome to Awakens live stream. Happy Mother's Day. Um, so I am so proud to be in a church with, with so many incredible moms. Uh, you guys make sacrifices day after day and are absolutely exemplary. Um, we just appreciate you, you so much, the way that you uh, serve the Lord and the way that you serve your families. Tonight we're going to worship together, and uh, I, I know this is going to be a joyful time, just praising God, looking to Him uh, through the midst of this continued strange season. We're going to do something a little different tonight. All the songs we're singing are straight scripture tonight. We thought we'd have a little bit of a scripture song night, so uh, some might be a, a touch new, uh, and some might be familiar, but I encourage you guys to not only to sing along as soon as you catch on, but you can even try and sing without looking at the words as, as we continue and, and uh, get get this scripture in your heart. We'll put up all these videos also early in the week. So if you want to uh, be singing these songs and, and memorizing these scriptures as a family, you're, you uh, certainly are encouraged to do so. Let's sing together. Worship him. Look to our Savior, Jesus Christ. Sing Hebrews 12. For since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders in the sin that so easily entangles. Let us run with. Perseverance, the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith for the joy. take communion here. We look to Christ. That, that song is all about looking 
This, and the scripture is all about looking to Jesus Christ as our leader. We, we've just got to look to him constantly, day after day after day. And, we, and we've got to remember the life he led. We've got to remember the sacrifice that he made on the cross. And we're going to do that through communion here in a little bit. And so I want to remind you about that, to have bread and, and juice or wine, if you have those available in your house, and get those ready. We'll take communion after this next song. Also, if you want to participate in the service fully tonight, uh, you can join Awaken's group chat, uh, the Awaken Church group chat on the app GroupMe, and you can download that, and you can add yourself if you go to Awaken's website, awakencolumbus.com slash GroupMe, and you can go ahead and add yourself, or you can ask someone else to add you to that group chat. Later on, we'll share prayer requests with one another through, through GroupMe. Would you pray with me now? Lord, we, uh, we love you, God. We want to honor you. We want to bless you with our worship, God. And I pray that you would draw us out and help us to worship you in spirit and in truth, God. And we pray that these scriptures would drive deep into our hearts and our minds and transform us, God. Transform us through your word as we sing to you in worship tonight, we pray, God. We thank you that you are worthy, God, and that you are good. In Jesus' name, amen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in is the good news we celebrate that is the gospel that God sent his son into the world to save us not to condemn us but to save us by his blood by his suffering we're going to take communion now we're going to remember together as as a church we are together in this we're one in this whether you're alone or watching with others we are together and looking to Christ to remember what he's done for us So let's remember uh, his broken body and his shed blood. Go ahead and take the bread and the wine or juice, remembering what Christ has done through the cross.
This is the time in our service where we pray for one another, bring our needs before one another, and this is uh, when you can use that Awaken Church uh, group chat. So I'd encourage you to post any prayer request, small, big, whatever it is, uh, personal for others in your family, in your workplace, in your sphere, and uh, we'll, we'll pray for those as they come in. I'd encourage you to pray out loud for those as they come in, catch the ones you can, and, and together we'll get all of them. And our, our staff and our elder team also prays for these throughout the week as well. In addition to the prayer requests that come in, or, or if you're watching this later and you don't have access to, to group me or the group chat, I want to ask you guys to pray along with believers all across the world for revival in the church right now. This is something we as a church we've been praying for for quite some time, that we would uh, f- follow that, that uh, command in Revelation chapter 2 to remember our first love, to, to remember Christ and what he's done for us and not be distracted by the things of this world or even by the church and by ministry. Let's pray that the church around the world would we would remember our first love. And I think through this time, we're sensing our need for God. The world is sensing its need for God. That the seeds for revival are there. The the seeds are there. We've got to pray and ask that God would do something marvelous that we can't do in and of ourselves and, and be willing ourselves to be a part of that. So let's pray for revival and let's pray in faith for revival and pray for all the needs that come in. Go ahead and take five minutes to do that now and then we'll come back together with a song here.
So good to worship with you all tonight. I get to be on here tonight to wish all of the women of Awaken Happy Mother's Day. And before I give you some encouragements, I just want to recognize that today might bring a mixed bag of emotions for some of you, whether you've lost a mom or uh, maybe you're longing to be a mom or maybe you're sharing this role with another mom um, or maybe you have a, a broken relationship with your mom. I just want you to know today that God sees you there and he is with you and he is near to you. And I know today is especially tender for me as I celebrate um, a, a very special woman who chose life for my babies. But I also grieve that she is not um, able to, to be with them any longer. And so um, you're not alone in the emotions that, that um, are gathered up in this day. And I just want you to know that. So mamas, I just wanna encourage you today and remind you that you have been so sovereignly handpicked for your specific children. And God ordained your families just the way they are. And I don't know if you're anything like me, but sometimes I wonder what God was thinking when he put four little little ones in, in my care. And there are so many days where I'm asking the Lord, like, why me? Why did you think I could do this? And yet he shows us through the Bible from the beginning to the end that he is ready to equip those who are willing and those who are ready to say yes. And we don't have to be able, we don't have to be um, adequate for the job because he is. And so I just wanna encourage you today that you are God's best pick for your children. And he is equipping you to do his good work, which is mothering your, your, your kids. And that goes for adult children, moms out there who have adult children, that goes for um, those who have school-aged children and those who are just welcoming little babies into their home now. Just know that, that this was a sovereign plan by the Lord that you would be their mamas and you're doing such a great job. Anyways, just wanted to say happy Mother's Day to you all. I know that you guys are doing the very best that you can possibly be doing with your kids in whatever situations you're in. And I hope that you feel celebrated today for the woman that you are. Um, and yeah, I love you all so much and I look forward to being with you all soon. Here we go again. One more week of elastic waistbands and slowly decreasing personal hygiene. Aren't you glad that God doesn't change like our culture does? In just one day, in one hour, our whole world changed. And here we are. Thank you, God, that you don't change 
like shifting shadows. You're the same yesterday, today, and forever. My name's Chris Old, and I'm one of the pastors here at Awaken. I'm so glad to be with you here tonight as we look towards God's Word and celebrate the fact that through the Spirit, we have power to do what He wants us to do. And it's for our joy's sake and His glory's sake that we obey His, bills, his will. So it's with that that we turn to Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 19. Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 19. Uh, through verse 30. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. I have no one else like him who will show genuine concern for your welfare. For everyone looks out for their own interest, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know that Timothy has proved himself, because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him as soon as I see how things go with me, and I'm confident in the Lord that I myself will come soon. But I think it is necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus, my brother, co-worker, and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger, whom you sent to take care of my needs. For he longs for all of you and is distressed because you heard he was ill. Indeed, he was ill and almost died. But God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but also on me, to spare me sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I am all the more eager to send him, so that when you see him again, you may be glad, and I, have may, I may have less anxiety. So then welcome him in the Lord with great joy, and honor people like him, because he almost died for the work of Christ. He risked his life to make up for the help you yourselves could not give me. So we're fairly deep into our series, the Apostle Paul's letter to the church at Philippi. You notice the affection that Paul has for this young church right off the bat, don't you? Look in the very first verse, verse 19. Paul says, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, that I also may be cheered when I receive good news about you. So Paul planted this church 10 years prior to the writing of this letter. And he writes this letter from a Roman prison being persecuted for the gospel. We read about how he wept, bled, and celebrated uh, with these young believers to help establish the church at Philippi in Acts chapter 16. And now he wants to be cheered by their growth. That is, he wants Timothy to bring him news of their ever-growing joy in Christ. After all, he can't just grab an iPhone or a laptop and chat with them. Uh, at that time, you had to have someone actually go physically share a message, in this case with uh, Paul, and then Paul would send word back to the church and his response or vice versa. And that someone is Timothy here. And he was very special to Paul. In fact, Paul went as far as to say in verse 20, I have no one else like him who will show genuine concern for your welfare, for everyone looks out for their own interest not those of Jesus Christ. So what made Timothy so special here? There are a handful of reasons why Paul had a special respect for this young believer named Timothy. First, Timothy was only in his mid-30s, and typically that was not an age associated with influence or responsibility. To put it in context, the religious leaders called Pharisees were not appointed to that spiritual position until age 30. So Timothy would have been seen on, on the young side. That was surely why Paul says in his letter directly to Timothy right before his death. In 1 Timothy 4.12, Paul says to Timothy, don't let anyone look down on you because you're young, but set an example for the believers in speech and conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity. So Paul would not have encouraged Timothy not to let anyone look down on him because of his youth if that weren't an issue in the church. So clearly it was. And this is significant, folks, because the kingdom of God is no respecter of age and alone. Jesus said during his earthly ministry, let the little children come to me. And he'll say when he comes again for his church to those who think they have it all together because of their religious pedigrees or because of what they perceive as good moral deeds, uh, he'll say to them, depart from me. I never knew you. So Jesus is a respecter of anyone, regardless of age, ethnicity, race, so on, education, background, whatever. He, he is a fan of anyone who will turn to him and rely on his grace and his mercy, not on works or what the world deems uh, something that, that gives us worth and value. 
So Timothy was respected then not because of the way in which the world saw him or evaluated his worth. Uh, He wasn't old enough. He came from a mixed background with a Greek father and a Christian mother and grandmother. Yet Paul sees his heart for God. Just look at Philippians chapter 1 verse 21. Paul says, For everyone looks out for their own interest, not those of Jesus Christ. So Paul's using Timothy here as an example of what Paul's already described in the first 11 verses of Philippians chapter 2, where he talks about Christ emptying himself, humbling himself on our behalf, that he says he obeyed even to dying. uh, uh, He died for us, and he not only died for us, but he died for us on the cross. And we're to mirror that. And he sets Timothy up as a living, breathing example of this Christ-like sacrifice. So that's the second reason why Paul respected him. It was the age, then also the example that Timothy was setting for the church that was Christ-like. But why these two characteristics make Timothy a special example for Paul to rightly say, I have no one else like him, there was a deeper, more personal reason why Paul loved Timothy so. It says in Philippians chapter 2, verse 22, But you know that Timothy has proved himself, because, a son with, because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. He had a father-son relationship uh, with Timothy. And we see this when we read the history of their relationship in Acts chapter 16. You see, Paul planted the church during his first missionary journey, and now he's taking his second trip, his second missionary journey, and he, he runs into Timothy, who he had led to Christ during his first trip, and now he sees that Timothy has matured during his second trip. We read about that in Acts chapter 16, starting in verse 1. It says, Paul came to Derby and then to Lystra, where a, couple, where a disciple named Timothy lived, whose mother was Jewish and a believer, but whose father was a Greek. The believers at Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him. Paul wanted to take him along on the journey, so he circumcised him because of the Jews who lived in that area, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. As they traveled from town to town, they delivered the decisions reached by the apostles and elders in Jerusalem for the people to obey. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and grew daily in numbers. So Paul spoke well of Timothy because he led him to Christ again during his first church at first trip, and he saw that Timothy had developed into a well-respected, mature young believer on his second trip. So on, on his second trip, he says, Timothy, why don't you join me in my ministry and tag along? And he becomes uh, one of Paul's primary disciples. Side props to Timothy, by the way, here. He was circumcised as an adult to keep the Jewish Christians off his back that might have been stumbled had he not been uh, circumcised because he had a Greek father. Uh, There has to be a special, unique, one-of-a-kind reward in heaven for such a sacrifice. But seriously... This relationship was very special between this older man named Paul and his young mentee, Timothy. Timothy was at the very beginning of his ministry at this point, and Paul was was slowly nearing the end. You see, in context here, fathers trained trained their sons vocationally. There was no trade school. There was no degree or certificate. The father was a degree or the certificate. For example, if, uh, let's say, uh, there was a blacksmith, and the, the blacksmith had a son. That son's certificate would be the dad, because everybody would know, hey, there's old Mark, the blacksmith, and that's his son, so he must be good at what he does. The problem was, Timothy's dad was not a believer, and Timothy wanted to lay his life down in the work of the gospel. But I believe that Paul was even more impactful than your decent, run-of-the-mill bio dad. I believe he was double dad, a father times two for young Timothy. First, he led him to Christ, and Paul often refers to those that he has led to Christ as his children. He does so in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 14. He says, I am writing this not to shame you, but to warn you as my dear children. Even if you had 10,000 guardians in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. Therefore, I urge you to imitate me. So see, Paul calls those that he led to Christ in Corinth his children, and he is their father. But then listen to 
the way in which Paul refers to Timothy in the very next verse, and he does so with this kind of affection in other places in Scripture as well. Uh, again, the very next verse, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17, the first part. He says, For this reason I have sent to you Timothy, my son whom I love, who is faithful in the Lord. So Paul was first his father once over through leading him to Christ. He was his spiritual father. He's two times his father through his special love for him. It's just a special God-given love. Isn't this beautiful? Paul invited Timothy to join him in the adventure of growing churches all over the place, establishing churches, following up with them, encouraging them, uh, uh, exhorting them, and so on. And now, in one of Paul's darkest hours, he's waiting what might be a possible death sentence under Roman authority in prison. Timothy is ministering to his needs. Sometimes in a a discipleship relationship, something special happens. You move from a student uh, teacher type of partnership to one where you're mutually serving one another and serving in ministry together. This is the glorious fruit of the gospel. And I hope all of us are allowing others to build into us in Jesus' name. And I also hope we're at the same time building into others for uh, the kingdom's sake as well. So now we dive off from a better understanding of this passage to a look in. As we look inside ourselves and ask the Holy Spirit to see if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting, we'd be wise to look again at Philippians chapter 2, verse 21. It says, For everyone looks out for their own interest, not for those of Jesus Christ. Everyone else was looking to get their wallets fat, their houses bigger, their vocations more uh, satisfying, and their romantic life more fulfilling. But Timothy was different. So what makes Timothy different from all the others who were looking to their own interest, not the interest of Jesus Christ? The answer is critical. I mean, what enables someone to be able to take hold of the privilege to empty themselves in sacrificial love and sacrifice for those whom Christ died for? What stuff did Timothy have in himself that was absent in others? Did he have greater greater moral fortitude? Was his willpower somehow supercharged above all others? Did he have a strong Christian mother and grandmother, and did that give him the upper hand of familiarity and experience with the righteous life? Was he somehow smarter spiritually, or did he simply gel with spiritual stuff better than the average bear? Did it just fit him better? Well, you probably know where I'm heading. None of these assumptions about Timothy are true. As we said last week, it's only the Lord who can give us the desire and the ability to do what pleases him. The stuff, so to speak, that Timothy had that made him different from all the others, who again, look out for their own interest and not the interest of Christ, it's one simple thing. It wasn't Timothy's spiritual pedigree or better moral compass. It was Submission. One word, submission. It wasn't trying harder. It was just the opposite. It was giving up. It was saying to God, I can't do this on my own. I want to try. I don't want to submit to your ways. I would rather drink or rely on my own good religious behaviors or trust in my family or loved ones or check out with entertainment. I would rather my life be about work or fun or a million other things. But God, in my heart of hearts, you've changed me, and I know those things will never satisfy me. So I take hold of the power you've given me to do what pleases you, to transform my sinful nature to thirst for real water that will satisfy. So what is it that you and I need to lay at God's feet and say, I want this. Go ahead and fill in the blank. It could be a relationship, a vocational thing, entertainment, whatever. I want this thing, fill in the blank. I want it more than you, God, but I know it's not honoring you. So here it is. Please change my heart, and I take hold of a changed desire that I know you're going to give me to follow you. I take hold of it in Jesus' name. Amen. We can pray that as a start, can't we? Paul says in the verse that we just read that most are are too preoccupied with self to serve Christ. What if we had an app that communicated with the chip in our brains how we spent our time? That'd be kind of scary, wouldn't it? Like the app on my phone that I can enable in my settings, and it reports on how much time I spend in apps like Chrome and Bible and YouTube. And I I actually had to set it to only allow me to play 
uh, MLB tap baseball for 30 minutes a day because I was getting carried away. Hey, you know I love baseball and that's the closest thing I can get to it right now, so I'm trying, like all of us. But what if the chip in our brains delivered the time we spent thinking and doing various things? It might report 45 minutes thinking about my hair, 50 minutes watching the news, one hour exercising followed by an hour and a half thinking about how thankful I am for elastic waistbands during this quarantine, one hour reading the Bible, and on it goes. That app would likely reveal some alarming things to all of us, wouldn't it? I think namely it would reveal that now even though we have all the time in the world, at least for some of us, or at least more of us uh, than not, or we have more time than usual at the very least, I should say, uh, even with that time, we don't do the things we know that God would have us do. We're not, for many of us, we're not getting in the word more. We're, we're not serving others in Jesus' name more because it's a heart issue. And the issue isn't just better strategies. That's important. But the, import, the, the, the number one thing we need to do is submit, crying out for him to change us, then taking steps of obedience. In what specific ways is he asking you and me to obey tonight? There's steps that he's asking us to take in obedience that we might not only look in, but also look out. It says in Philippians chapter 2, verse 29, So then, welcome him in the Lord with great joy and honor people like him, because he almost died for the work of Christ. He risked his life to make up for the help, help you yourselves could not give me. We didn't have time to talk about the one Paul's praising in these two verses, but it was Epaphroditus. And he's only mentioned here in Philippians and not elsewhere in all the Bible. And look at what Paul says the church is to honor him for. He was willing to die for the work of the gospel. And, you know, this tells me that Christians should not highly esteem a talented person or a beautiful person or an intelligent person or someone who's uh, highly athletic. All those things are, are worth admiring, but the things that we, the, the, the people that we highly esteem, that have our hearts, they should be ones who have made significant sacrifices for Christ. How are you and I living this out? That is, who are we honoring with our acts, our thoughts, and our money in Jesus' name and for his kingdom's sake? We give our money to what we worship, don't we? If we worship the Ohio State Buckeyes, then we will give our money to season tickets, even at the cost of a chunk of money that could be used for our future retirement or something else, won't we? If the eyes of our hearts are fixed on Jesus, then praise from our mouth will shower individuals like parents who have laid their life down for their children in Jesus' name. Those whose minds are fixed on Christ will be enthralled with the missionary who served faithfully for 20 years. Their daydreaming will go to young believers like Caspian Marshall, who's grown in his faith like crazy during this quarantine. Writing down prayer requests on GroupMe and reaching out to friends with Awakens Gospel video. Give me someone who suffered on the pathway to obedience in Christ, whether it's in sharing the gospel, in making sacrifices for Christ, or simply living in the pain of a fallen world for Jesus. Give me that any day of the week. Give me that person every day of the week and twice on Sunday over those who have laid their lives down, laid their time down, laid their money down on the baseball field or the boardroom. Not that those things aren't admirable, but those I truly esteem are ones who have laid their lives down for the kingdom. So now we move to prayer. We give this to God and ask him for his strength. We look up. Please stand with me and pray. Lord, please change my vision to esteem those who have given their lives to you. Please help me to release my time and my resources to you so that you may say of me what Paul said of Timothy, I have no one like him. I step out in obedience this week for my joy and your glory's sake. In Jesus' name, amen.
to present you before his glory is present with our fall to him who is able to keep you from stumbling to present you before his glory is presence with our fall, with creation. To the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty. May God grant you and me the grace and mercy to walk out in obedience for his joy's sake, his glory's sake, that we might walk in life more abundant. In Jesus' name, amen.